Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Metziah Daf Mem Zion. Today's stuff is sponsored by Becky Goldstein, a loving memory of her husband's friend and Chavruta Avraham Ben Shlomo Beim on his seventh year at site. True Eved Hashem, who founded the El Azar English Kola, which delves into the intricacies of the Talmud. I have the scoot to be learning with his Marot, which inspired me to reach greater heights through the guidance of our trailblazer, Rabbi Nit Michelle, who provides clarity and daily introspection to our learning. Today's app is sponsored by the Hadron Zoom Group for Rufuash Lema of Yaakov Yitzchak Ben Miriam Esther, the son of our dear friend Miriam. Yitz, you should have a speedy and a full recovery. Okay. We're going to get started, continue our issue of Chalipin, and discuss a whole bunch of issues related to Chalipin. Again, the two issues we had yesterday were can you use a coin to affect a Chalipin transaction? And the second issue was can you? acquire a coin through a Chalipin transaction. Now we're going to have, I'm a rabba, I'm a rab huna, very bottom of men, vapa, mebet. Mechor li be'elu, we're going to have a strange kind of transaction. You have a pile of, uh, let's say I have a pile of money, and you say to me, can you, mechor li be'elu, sell me, no, sorry, I say to you, sell me your item with this pile of money. Okay, so basically, I take this pile of money and I said, listen, I want to buy your item with this pile of money. Now, you have no idea, right? It reminds me of that, that thing, you know, how many jelly beans are in the jar, right? Where you have to guess and estimate. You have no idea how much money is in the pile. And you basically agree. Say, sure, I'll take your pile of money. Now, this basically looks like we're doing a barter. You're taking a pile of money. Now, it's you're not really using money as money, right? You're using it saying, I'll take this pile of money. And in place of, let's say, your cow. Okay? So um, so now, kana, this is effective. V'yesh lo alav ona. Okay? So now, basically what happens here is, let's say, the money is not enough, not even close to the amount. Okay? And it's off by what we're going to see as ona, which is a six. It's a six less than what we're supposed to do. Then... You can have a claim. Okay, I can't remember now who was what, but I had the pile, let's say, of money. And I said, I think that's what the example I gave. And I'm going to buy your cow with this pile of money. If you give me the cow and take the money. Okay, so first of all, by you taking the money, it's effective, even though normally money doesn't work, right? Seems like, and now we're going to see, wait, does this mean he holds that money can be chalipin? Right, because it sounds like you can use money to affect a chalipin transaction. So we're going to get back to that in a little while. They're not going to deal with it right away. But again, you take the money, it's effective. But if in the end you find out that it was less than, you know, that the difference was a six less than what you were deserving to get, then you can insist I give you more money. Kana, okay, so now we're going to explain why these two things that Rafuna said. Now, I just want to point out, Rabba says this in the name of Rafuna. We're going to have a bit of a different version in the name of someone else who quotes Rafuna. Kana, afagav de mashach. So, I will acquire the cow, even though I didn't pull the cow, okay? As soon as you took the money, the cow is mine, even though it's still in your domain. Because the whole thing is you didn't really care how much money. And therefore, it's like a Kenyan Chalipin here, okay? Because right, what's a Kenyan Chalipin? We're going to trade apples for oranges. We're going to trade a cow for a donkey, no one's really checking what the value is. No one really cares what the value is. Okay, don't worry. We're going to get later to what do you mean no one cares what the value is? Anyone who buys anything, of course, cares what the value is. And we might understand this a little differently. Now, why do we have ona'a still? If, if you didn't care, well, that's what we're assuming. You didn't really care how much money it was. So why can you later claim, hey, it wasn't enough money? Well, because you use the language of a sale. Now that means, okay, well, really I used it. I said, Mechorli, sell me. And then you said, yes, I will agree. So we agreed this was a sale, which means all laws of sale apply. Ona'a applies. So it was a barter, but it was also in the language of a sale. And that way Ona'a would be in, would be in place. Rav Abba Amar Rav Huna, but now we have somebody else quoting Rav Huna who says, wait a minute, I don't agree with you about everything you said. That I agree with you. Okay. It is a Kenyan, even though it's only money was transferred. And there is no ona. Okay. Why is there no ona? For obvious reasons. Because you didn't, you showed you didn't care. You were willing 
to take this money, whatever it was. So you gave up on your rights to claim that you were underpaid for the animal, for whatever it was. Now the Gemara says, Pshita damim Now, obviously, this is right. So it's clear in a case where someone gives money and doesn't gives a pile of money, right? We make a deal with this pile of money and you don't care, emakpida lehem. Right, right. The case we explained was a case where obviously you don't really care how much you get paid, and it says that it works as a chalipin transaction. So this is effective. So a chalipin transaction will be effective, right? Even if it's not really the right value or whatever, or you didn't know how much it was worth and you took it anyway. As soon as you take that pile of money, it's effective. And it, and likewise, you could say as soon as, like we've seen a machlif para bechamul. As soon as you take the para, the chamor of yours is mine, the donkey, right? Even though I didn't take it. You pulled one animal, the other one automatically becomes mine. But now they say, But what if the case is that we have, I have a donkey, you have a cow. I want your cow, you want my donkey. and But I care and you care how much they're valued. Now, in this case, do we say, or there was a pile of money, okay, for a donkey? It doesn't matter what it is. If we care how much is in that pile of money or how much each animal is worth and we want it to be exact, does that change it and we leave chalipin and we go more to a sale? And once it's a sale, what has to happen? Well, maybe the sale won't be effective until both sides have the item in hand. The same way we say that when money, if I pay money, what did we say? Basic laws of Kinyanim. If I pay money, but don't get the item yet, the item is not mine. So if we say that in Chalipin, let's say it's either a pile of money, then if you took the pile of money, well, the other item won't be mine yet because the money at that point doesn't function like Chalipin, like Rafuna said, it's Kone. No, it functions more like money in a regular transaction. Or if we switch cow and donkey, but we care how much they're each worth, it's as if I'm buying a donkey for a certain amount of money and you're buying a cow for a certain amount of money. And until we both pull our items, it might not be an actual Kenyan yet. The Kenyan won't be effective because each side is like they paid money without pulling their item. So perhaps in a case where we're doing a Chalipin and each one cares very much so about the value, maybe... It's not effective until they each pull the item that they're acquiring. And so if I pull my item and you don't pull yours, we can actually cancel the transaction. So the question is, what's the story? I'm Rav Adabar, Ava Tashma. I said, let's learn from this case. And now we're going to pick a case exactly like I just said. You've got a cow and you're standing in the shuk. And I say, hey, what are you doing with that cow? You say, well, I'm actually trying to buy a donkey with it. I want to trade it for a donkey. I don't really want a cow. I have enough cows at home. I want a donkey. So I say, oh, you know what? I've got a donkey. I'll give you a donkey for your cow. But we don't just finalize the deal yet. We say, okay, so we start assessing the value of the donkey, of the para. In other words, we agreed in theory to start the deal, but we want to start assessing how much is it worth. So after we assess, okay, this is worth this, this is worth that, and we're going to go ahead with the deal. So you, so the, the donkey owner, I'm the donkey owner, I pull your para. Below is speak bala para lib Now you haven't pulled your side. Now that was the whole idea. Is in a regular Kenyan Chalipin, it doesn't matter that you didn't pull it. The deal is done. As soon as one side pulls it, the deal is done. But you didn't pull the donkey yet from me. In the meanwhile, the donkey drops dead. At this point, it's not worth very much. You can say, thanks, but no thanks. Deal is off. Now, according to what we said, Kenyan Chalipin normally works... Right? This is a regular barter. As soon as I pull the para, if the donkey dies, it's your tough luck. The deal is done because the donkey's yours already. As soon as I pull the para, the donkey's yours. 
If it's dead, it's dead in your domain. Even though it was physically in my domain, it's really considered yours and you wouldn't be able to get it back. So what do you see here? Shmami now, we get an answer to our question. When you have a Kenyan Chalipin and you care, it's as if when you paid the para, all you did was pay the money. You didn't get your donkey yet. It's not a done deal. You can renege. So when my donkey dies, you could say, no thanks. So that's what we think. And then we get an answer to our question. But I'm a Rava. Rava says, wait a minute. We've got a serious problem with the whole question. Because, and I mentioned this before. Are you trying to say that people who do barter deals are, are, are idiots? They don't, they don't care how much money it's worth? That they'll trade a safety pin for a donkey? I mean, seriously, right? People don't do that kind of thing. Every chalipin is a case where people care how much they're getting for their item. Barter is just a different form of a sale. Obviously, we care how much we're getting. And yet, it's still acquired. So there you have your answer to your question. Of course, it works. One side pulls. The other side is already acquired to the other person. Now we're stuck, though, because the brighta makes no sense. How do we explain this brighta? What's the case of the brighta we just quoted? Well, you're missing an important fact. You had a cow. I had a donkey. We were going to trade. But when we did the assessment, what happened? We realized that your cow is worth less than my donkey. And the only way to give me the proper amount would be to give me a, don a cow and a sheep or a lamb. Doesn't matter, okay? But something else. Ooh, and then what happened? So basically, even though it doesn't say so, when we did the assessment, we realized that yours wasn't worth enough and that you had to add something. Now the bright is teaching you. In that case, the reason why this transaction didn't go through was because my donkey died before you finished giving me everything you were supposed to give me. You only gave me the para. You didn't give me the tale also. That's not a good enough mashiach. Even though I pulled, let's say, 80% of the deal, it doesn't matter. I didn't pull 100% of what you were supposed to give me. That's why it didn't work. But if I pulled the para and the talent, now of course it doesn't say this in the Braita, but Rava basically uses his logic and says there's no way, no how, that we can start to think that there's a distinction between people who care about Khalip and people who don't care about Khalip and that most Khalip are done and people don't care about the, the value. That's just not possible. So he changes the Braita in order to make sense with this and basically answers the question by saying there's really no question, okay? Because every Kenya Chalipin works even, right? And and specifically when people are, are cons you know, do want the value, it still doesn't turn it into a, as if it's a money transaction and both sides need to then basically pull their item for it to be effective, not true. Now we're going to go back to Rav Huna. And try to figure out, does Rav Huna say that Matban Asa Chalipin? Because it sounds like it. So Amramar, quoting from what Rav Huna said. So again, we're really focusing on the first part. It's Kone. Right? You you say, give me your pile of money. Right? And as I say, uh, sorry, you say, I say, I want to buy your item with this pile of money, I say. And you say, no problem. And as soon as you take the money, the item is mine. Even though normally, right, what do you see here? It looks, normally money doesn't affect a transaction. This is a chalip and a chalip and transaction done in this way, it works, which makes us think that matbana sa chalipin, according to him, the money could be the chalipin, the one that does affects the transaction. So lema sava rafuna matbana sa chalipin, even though we saw most people said no. Does he side on the other side of that machloket? Lo, no, not necessarily. How can you explain Rav Huna? And we did this also previously, this kind of answer. Rav Huna sever like Rabbi Yochanan de Amal, Dvar Torah Ma'ot Konot. Remember Rabbi Yochanan, we'll get back to him in Rish Lakish later today as well. He holds like Rabbi Yochanan, who says that by Torah law, really giving money affects the transaction. But what? Why did they say Meshicha though is Kone? Because Gezer Hashem Yomrunis Rafuchi Techabaliya. We're worried that maybe there'll be a fire in your in your root and you're at it, and you'll just leave my stuff to burn because you don't care about them anymore because they're not yours. And if that's the case, when do the rabbis make a xera? Only in common cases. 
Milton Deshrich Gas Ruba Rabbanan. In a common case, the rabbis made their their gzera. But Milta de lo shricha lo gazru bar rabbanan. But the rabbis didn't institute this ordinance in a very rare case. Now let's talk about our case. If you, if I say, take this pile of money for that item and you don't even count the money, that's a very rare transaction. Most people wouldn't do that. Because it's such a rare transaction, the money is kone because we revert back to Torah law. Because the gzera of the rabbis, the ordinance the rabbis instituted is just not relevant. In a case, that's so rare. And then that basically means that you could, and we don't really know, this is just a possibility, you could say that Rav Huna thinks it just does in this unique case because it's a rare situation. But this is not Rav Huna, this is Mar Huna, the son of um, Rav Nachman, uh, sorry, right, son of Rav Nachman. He says to Rav Ashi, you learned this all in this way, which is, you learned Rav Huna, and then you had this deliberation. Is he saying matbeana sachalipin? And then you said not necessarily. Could be he holds matayim matbeana sachalipin. We could explain it that he holds like Rabbi Yochanan. But anan hachi matnitnula. We our version of Rav Huna is that he actually explicitly said v'chein amar Rav Huna ein matbeana sachalipin. That he specifically came out and said it. I don't think that matbea can be used for a chalipin transaction. And then you would have to say, well, in this case, it's the exception because he holds like Rabbi Yochanan. But normally it wouldn't work. And that's, so he says it explicitly, not that we can say maybe this, maybe that, and it's not necessarily he says it is, but it, maybe it's not. No, he actually said explicitly, and it's not like we have to try to infer, yes, this, that, the other thing. Okay, Bamet Koni. Now we have a big question about Chalipin. And this seems more like when we're talking about a Kenyan Sudar, Okay, where we're doing a, a symbolic transaction. Normally, nowadays, we do it with a handkerchief. So I don't know if you notice this, but whenever you do a Kenyan with a handkerchief, okay, the question is, whose handkerchief do we use? Okay, who's who's giving the, the and who do they give it to, right? So in any transaction, one person takes something of theirs and gives it to the other side. So who's supposed to give it to who? So Rav Amal, Bikil Yoshel Kone. It's the vessel of the buyer. The buyer gives the seller. Okay, this makes a lot of sense. Okay, we'll see it inside in a minute, right? I want to buy something from you and you're going to give it to me. So how do we do it? I give you something. It's, it's, it's like symbolic of being a barter. What's a barter? I give you something, you give me something. So when we do this symbolic chalipin transaction, because remember, we keep talking about two chalipin. One is we're actually trading two objects. And one is we're doing a symbolic transfer, right? Where we pick up a handkerchief. And so now I take my handkerchief, I give it to you. And because you're getting something from me, you're willing to give me something. That's the way it's working. Okay, that's very logical, right? The more, that's the more obvious explanation. Levi Amar, Bekil Yoshal Maknit. You're the seller. You take a handkerchief, give it to me. And with that, I acquire your other object. So now this is sounding like what? Like a Kenyan Agav. Remember how a Kenyan Agav works? You give me a piece of land. With that land, I acquire movable property, right? So now we're doing the reverse, which is, with this movable item, I can acquire other items, right? So you give me a handkerchief. Now that I've acquired the handkerchief, I can acquire other things as well. So now they're going to say, so first they, they don't even explain Levi. They say, like we'll explain further on. And before we get to his explanation, we're going to ask a big question on him. That would he, he actually, if it works like this, Kenyan Agav, which in the end we're going to say it's not how it works. But that's what they thought when they heard Levi in the first place. So Amalei Rafunami Diskata Larava. It sounds like you're acquiring, you can acquire land by passing over this cloak, okay? Or piece of material, right? You give me a piece of cloth, a handkerchief. And with that, I can get not only the handkerchief, but I also get land, let's say. That would be, that would be how it will work. Well, in Cain, then this is the exact opposite of what the Mishnah says about this. Because what does the Mishnah say about Kinyan Agav, right? This is Nichasim Sheyesh Lamachrayu, which is land, because it comes with a guarantee. Nichnimim Nichasim Sheyesh Lamachrayu. You're basically saying you can take things like movables 
and with that acquire land. But Anan Ipchitznan, but we learned in the Mishnah the exact opposite. What did we learn? If you remember, it's a Mishnah in Kiddushin, when we talked about Kinyanim. Nechasim she'en lem achrayu, niknim nechasim she'yesh lem achrayu. It's called a Kinyan Agav, and it's a Kinyan Agav Karka. You give me a piece of land, and with the land I get the other stuff, right? So it's this doesn't make any sense that this should work, Levi, is what he says to him. So Amalei, this was a question Rav Hunami described to ask Rava about Levi. So Rava answers him, he says a, a very strong response. He says, if Levi were here and heard the way you butchered his opinion and totally misunderstood it, you know what he would do? Have a pulsa denura. He would pull out a pulsa denura, which is like a arrows of fire. He would shoot at you. He would he would go crazy. I say go ballistic, but that's a word that I don't know what I talk about these days. But he would go crazy. Sorry, it's not that you're giving him the cloak, right? It's not like you're giving me the cloak and with that I'm acquiring land. That's not how it's working at all. With what are we doing this kinyan? You give me a handkerchief. Now, I didn't give you anything, but you give me a handkerchief and I, what do I do? I accept it. Now, when I accept your handkerchief, how does that make you feel? You give me a gift and I accept it, right? I could say, oh, thanks, but no thanks. I don't really want your gift. So if I accept your gift, that makes you feel good. That gives you a certain amount of pleasure. That pleasure is measurable. And basically, we're going to say the following. When you give me the handkerchief, remember, you're selling me the item. You give me a handkerchief. I say, oh, thank you. I'll accept that. When I accept the handkerchief, you got benefit by the fact that I accepted your handkerchief. And because you got benefit and you're feeling good about me, you're willing to give me the item I'm trying to buy. And that's how the Kenyan Khalipin is affected. And that's how they explain it in the end. Okay, that's uh, right. Ruth is pointing out that just to go back from it, Pulsadunur, some people explain that it means you're excommunicating the person. I don't know if everyone explains it that way, but that, that lady would excommunicate you for, for saying that. So definitely there are commentaries to explain this. Could be even Rashi says it, I forget. Yeah, Rashi says, Lashon Shamta, right? He says it's a type of Shamta. Shamta is a type of uh, excommunication. Okay, now, so we have this Machlok at Levi and Rav about which, who takes the item of Halipin. Now we're going to learn that when we do this symbolic act, is it the buyer or is it the seller? Now we're going to see where this all comes from and we're going to learn that it's Kitanai. It's actually not only Machlok between Rav and Levi, but it's also a ton of Edic debate. And it all comes from this Pasuk, which we already mentioned that we were going to learn things from here. We're going to get to the Machlok of Rav Nachman and Rav Sheshet that also comes from here about does it have to be a Kli or can you do Chalipin with something else like fruits, produce, or, you know, we even got some money from there. It's all going to be learned out from Ruth. In the book of Ruth, what happens? It says, Zot Lefanim Israel. Okay, this was the rule, the way it used to go in Israel. About redemption and about tmura, which we'll talk about in a minute, like exchanges. To establish all things. A man would take off his shoe and give it to his friend. This is the way things would go in Israel. This is all an introduction to the section where basically there's the person who's the closest relative to Ruth and Naomi and is supposed to redeem their field and the property of their you know, their sons, their husbands, and and also marry Ruth, right, who's now supposed to do Yibam. And instead, he passes it on, basically causes it to be acquired to Boaz. Okay, he wants to give up on his rights to it, and he gives it to Boaz. So this is, this Pasuk teaches us a bunch of things. So they quote the Pasuk. Now they explain, Geula, in the beginning of the Pasuk, we talked about this Geula, Zomachira, that's a sale. And the quote of Pasuk in Vayikra, where actually there's a bit of a debate, it seems to be actually talking about redemption, but they explain here it's it's it means not to, it means uh won't be able to be sold. And we'll leave that issue aside. Tmura zo chalipin, because tmura means to exchange. That's what a tmura is. Okay, we'll get to the whole Masechet tmura and we'll learn all about you want to exchange one animal for another after you already designated to be a korban. So that's exchange. 
okay, you can't trade the animal once you, this is about the animal tithe. Once you animal tithe something, you can't just exchange it for a different animal. Um, that's where we see it's lo yamir is tamura and lo yachlifenu. Those mean the same thing to switch. So now it says, right, a man takes off his shoe and gives it to his friend. Now, what's clearly missing from the pasuk? Who took off the shoe and gave it to who? So, since it's unclear, we get two opinions. Me, Natan, the me. Boaz, Natan, the goel. Okay, the first opinion is Boaz, who is acquiring, he's the buyer here, gave his shoe to the other side. That matches the first opinion of, Le of Rav that we saw. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Goel, Natan, the Boaz. No, the one who is selling his rights, he gave the shoe. And that would prove Levi's opinion. Tan. Now we're going to just mention a bright about this. Konim, the, uh, sorry, now we're getting off on another issue, which is Levi, I'm um, sorry, Rav Sheshad and Rav Nachman. And their debate about with what can you affect a uh, Chalipin transaction that we already discussed before. Now we're going to see it coming from these same sukim. Konim bekli afapisha in Bosheva Pruta. So now there's a bright that says, you can acquire with a vessel even if it's not valued at a pruta. Okay, so normally, right, you need something valuable. That's why, you know, handkerchief, I don't even know if it's valued at a pruta, but we use it anyway because that's what it says in this bright. I'm Rav Nachman. Lo shanu ela bekli. Aval bepeire lo. So Rav Nachman says, and by the way, you can only use a kli. You can't use produce anything else. Rav Shesha demar filu bepeiro. Even peiro. And by the way, you would say then, what about this? What's this brighta then? The brightest says a kli that doesn't have a shav pruta. If it would be payro, then it would need to have be at least a pruta. But if you're using a vessel, it doesn't need to be a pruta. So now my tamid of Nachman, why does he say you can't use a kli? Amar kra, na'alo. What do we learn from shu? Na'al im, midiachrinilo. It has to be like a shoe. A shoe is a vessel, right? What does it mean to vessel? Usually it means either clothing or some kind of utensil that you would use for something. So there you, there you have it. My time at the Rav Shesha. We're going to do a ping pong now between the different uh, the each jars in this pesukim. Amar kra lekayim kol davar. It says these are the rules when you want to buy or exchange to establish any item. Now the simple reading of that pesuk means if you want to acquire an item, not the item that you're doing chalipin with. But he says you don't really need to say that, so I must be coming to teach you something else, which is to tell you that you can do chalipin with anything. What does Rav Nachman do with that? So what he's trying to tell you is you can acquire anything using a shoe. But and that's the simple reading of the Pasuk. Rav Shesha Nami Haktiv Na'alo. So what does Rav Shesha do with shoe? Why did it specifically say shoe? Has to be something complete. It can't be something half. So you can't take half a pomegranate, half a nut, a walnut. That's not going to work. It has to be complete. That's what they learned from Shu. A shoe is complete. It has to be something complete. Amar of Shesha Parader of Edi, Keman Katvina Ha'idna, Bimana de Kashir Lumikniya Bey. If you pay attention next time you're at a wedding, the end of the ketubah, they use this terminology. They use these exact words, Bimana de Kashir Lumikniya Bey. And now we're going to darshan them. This happened once before where we quoted words from a document that, you know, was the, this, by the way, comes up in most shtarot that are written. It's not just in a ketuba, but nowadays we don't have so many shtarot and that's where we normally see it. Um, so now, what? Do, why do we use these words? And we're darshaning them as if they're words from a pasuk, like we have the, the liberty to darshan psukim from the Torah. So here we're going to darshan psukim from a, from a document. Why? What they're really saying is, what does this indicate halachically? Why did they choose to use these words? Because it's telling you all sorts of halachic things about about kinyanim and things that we discussed just now. Bimana, what is mana? Mana is a kli, it's a vessel. So, because it says, right, you're going to acquire this bimana with a kli. Okay, so there it seems only a kli is something you can do a kinyan with, not other things. Dikasher, why do you have to say it's kosher to use? What do you mean it's kosher to use? It doesn't mean kashrus, obviously. It means it's it's valid to use. Well, it means there are some that are not kosher. What would it mean to not be kosher here in this context? To show that we disagree with Shmuel, we don't accept his opinion. Now moving to Amud Bet. What is a maroka? Big debate. Some people say it's um, date pits. Some people say Rashi says it's from um, dung. 
okay? That something that's, whatever it is, it's kind of disgusting. It's not really, you know, that's not kosher, so to speak. It doesn't mean kosher, kosher. It just means it's not respectable to do a king of with something disgusting. You know, Shmuel thought it was okay, but this, our documents say, no, it's not. Lemiknia, to acquire. La fuke mi delevi damar bekiliyosha makne. Said would mean to cause someone else to acquire. And that would mean the buyer would give you it in order for you to be able to acquire something that they're giving you, right? They're passing on to you. But lemiknia means to buy. So it means that you give something so that you can get something in return. That means the buyer gives it. Bay, um, with this, with this sounds like with this and not something else. Well, we might have included, right? We said kalim only and not he wrote before. And now this is saying and not a coin. Some people say, why do you need this? There's a whole question asked. Once it's, it has to be a kli, it's obvious it can't be money. And maybe that's why Rav Zvid and Itema Rav Ashi have a different way to darshan this because they think that's obvious. Amar lemute isure hana'at. Can't be something that was used, let's say, to worship Avodah Zara. You can't use a kli. It could be a vessel, but you can't use that to do a kinyan chalipin because you're not allowed to benefit from it. Ike de Amre, some people have a bit of a different way of darshaning these psukim. Be Amar Papa lem ute matbea, that's the same, but there's no debate about it. Rav Papa says matbea, and Rav Zvid and Rav Ashi, you said lem ute surayana, actually learned it from a different word, de kasher. Instead of saying kasher is to say, we don't hold like Shmuel about the Morika, they, um, Bimaroka, they say um, de kasher, they learn it from. Kosher means you can benefit from it, okay, and not something you can't benefit from. Aval, Morika lo itzrich. You don't even need to say Morika. It's obvious you can't do a Kenyan with a Morika. Okay, no one would even need to say such a thing. I would think you could also argue the opposite. Isurehana, obviously, you can't do a Kenyan with because you can't benefit from them. But anyway, they say the reverse. Okay, so that was. Um, all about, in other words, what happened here was we started with this big machlok at Rav and Levi about who, whose kli affects the Kalipin transaction, the buyer or the seller. From there, we got to the psukim of root. From there, we got to a different machlok that comes to the psukim from root about do we understand na'al to be really only a shoe and things like a shoe, or can we extend it even farther to mean pay rope? And from that, we got to the language in our documents, which actually matches Rav Nachman. And then we also saw it matches Rav and the Rav Levi debate. And we learned some other halakhot about. Um, about Kinyanim uh, from there. Now we go back to the Mishnah, Asimon Koneet Matbea. Okay, so an Asimon, if you remember what is the mean Koneet Matbea, the Matbea is the currency, the Asimon is not really considered a currency. So now it was certainly not compared to the coin. So now the question is, my Asimon, what is an Asimon? Okay, well, obviously wasn't the coin they used in telephones in those days. Neither is it the coin we use in telephones nowadays because we don't have those kind of phones anymore. But it was certainly when I was much younger. And, um, but they didn't have telephones in those days. So what is an asimo? Apparently when you went to the bathhouse, you would give a token in. And what would they do with the tokens? They give them to the person who was the balan, who was working in the bathhouse. The balan would see how many people were coming and would know how much water to warm up. So it was a token, right? Like nowadays it would be a token from an arcade or something like that. It doesn't have any inherent value. Metive. So now they're going to say, you can't possibly say an asimon is a token because listen to this bright. Ein mechal, actually, is it a, it's a Mishnah. Ein al asimon, b'siman you can't redeem your master sheni on an asimon and not on money that you bring into the Beit HaMerchatz, these tokens. Okay? Not on a, not, I shouldn't say money, but Right, not on these tokens you bring to the bathhouse. So what do you see here? So there's one thing called the nasimon, and there's another thing called the tokens. So obviously they can't be the same if they're listed as two different things. Right, you don't even understand anything to understand that these are obviously two different things. Well, if you want to suggest, maybe the second line in that brightest or in the Mishnah is coming to explain the first. What is an asimon? And sometimes they have this, even though it didn't say it. Sometimes they say that line is coming to explain the previous. Maybe you could say that, but halo tanahachi. Well, we have a different source, which I see here as a Mishnah in Eduyot and also a Tosefte Master Sheni that says in a way that it's 
clear they're two different things. And now you're going to see it very obviously. So the first we start off with a debate about an asimo. Rabbi Dosa says you can use it to redeem your master shani money, uh, food onto it. And Chachamim say you can't. Vishavim, but they both agree. But they both agree you can't use the tokens. So now what do you see? If there's a disagreement about the Asimon and they all agree about the tokens that they can't be used, obviously these are two different things. So it can't possibly be that an Asimon are the tokens. El Amr, B'yachan Amai Asimon, Pulsa. What is an Asimon? It's the, the raw material, like a coin, before they put the um, imprint on it. Okay, so that's what an asimon is, which is more valuable than a token, right? You think of those tokens in the, if you go to an arcade or something like that, I'm sure you frequent arcades, but you know, those kind of tokens, they're usually very thin and flat and they don't really have much value to them and you certainly can't turn them into coins. Whereas a, a plain flat coin that just doesn't have the imprint yet, that's something that could be a coin. It's it's very different. That's why theoretically, right, you can see that there's a machloket about the asimon doesn't yet have value, but has potential to have value as opposed to the token, which doesn't really have value. It's just used for something, but it's more like a commodity rather than a, than a, than a coin. So the asimon mentioned in the Mishnah, which again, compared to the currency is not currency, but it is more valuable than this token, more of a currency than the token. The Azra Rabbi Yochanan the Tamein, Rabbi Yochanan is consistent by right, calling this asimon this um, this uh, by saying this is the the coin before it has its imprint in it to Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Dosa, Rabbi Ishmael, and Ruta Barachat. So he said, Rabbi Yochanan, that Rabbi Dosa, Rabbi Ishmael said the same thing. Okay, this is a way we've seen this before, where they take two different opinions and they say they're really saying one and the same. So Rabbi Dosa had Amaran. We already saw him that an Asimon can be used for the the Chilo Master Sheni. And Rabbi Yishmael, Maihi, Detanya, Vitsarta, Kesapiadecha, Lerabot, Koldavar, and Itzrar, Bayad. Tsarta, Kesapiadecha means, right? Now that's, you're supposed to take the money, and there, by the way, this it's supposed to be silver, because Kesap is silver in the Torah. You're supposed to take silver money, bind it, like carry it, you know, together in a bundle in your hand. But why do they use the word Tsarta? You don't really need that. You could just say, Lakach, he took the money. So they learn from here, Rabbi Yishmael, kol davar ha-nitzral bayad, anything that can be held in your hand, which means it doesn't, and we're going to see in a minute, it doesn't need to be a real coin. It could be something that's prepared to be a coin and doesn't have the imprint in it yet. That's going to match Rabbi Dosa. That's the way Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Akiva omer, lerabot kol davar sheyesh alav tzura. Rabbi Akiva says what it means when it says tsarta, not nitzrar that could be collected in your hand, but from the Lashon of Tzura, which is the imprint that you put in the coin. So Rabbi Kiva says, it has to be something that has a Tzura. You cannot redeem it on Master Shani coins. So what you see here is Rabbi Yochanan said that Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Dosa say the same thing. And then from there, what do you learn? That the Asimon is something that doesn't have a Tzura, and that matches what Rabbi Yochanan said, that Asimon is a pulsa. Now we're going to go to the big machlok at Rabbi Yochanan and Rishakish about ma'ot, konot, and how it works. The fact that we say money doesn't affect a transaction anymore. Is that because, right, it's a Torah law that you have to do mashicha, you have to pull the actual object you're buying, and the money doesn't do anything by Torah law? Or Rabbi Yochanan who holds no, by Torah law the money acquires, but the rabbis instituted a takana. We've already seen this, but we're going to see it more in depth and go into some back and forth in the psukim, some ping pong between the two approaches. So they're going to introduce it by basically talking about this in the Mishnah, where it says, right? If you pull the payroll, I'm buying produce from you. I pull the produce, it's already mine. Even though I haven't paid the money, no one can renege on the deal. Whereas if I pull the money, it doesn't work. Okay, If you pull the money, then the payroll are not yet acquired to me and we can change our mind. Both sides could change their mind. Another Rabbi Shimon who said only one side, which we'll get back to him soon. So Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Tvar Torah Ma'ot Konot, this is going to be reviewed. By Torah law, actually the money would, if I passed you the money, that would be a done deal. But, We're worried that maybe you'll come and say, I paid the money and then you'll claim, oh, you know what? They were, they were burned in my attic. Sorry, I can't give them to you. 
and 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 they're if we'd said that the money acquired them, they'd be mine and they're gone. So and they're gone under my responsibility, even though they were in your house, which is exactly what causes the problem. We have something of mine in your house that would be it would cause problems. To which the Gemara says, I don't get it. Self, self, man, the I'm not going to have a loss in this case. If if there's a fire in your attic and my feet team get burned, well, there's the person who set it on fire. We can make that person responsible to give me my money back. So if so, man, the delay, kabai, shugumay. The one who made the fire has to pay. So obviously they're going to say, Alexei Shemati pulled delay, kaba onis. We're worried that maybe by accident a fire started, not that there was anybody responsible for the fire. Obviously, there's someone responsible for the fire. That person's going to pay. So now they say, and here's the problem. If we say it's basically mine, but it's in your domain, my, I'm sorry, if we say it's yours, that Mashiach is not Kone, and we're going to consider until I get my wheat, that wheat is my, is yours, then if Master Nafshe Vatarach if a fire falls out, uh, comes about, you're going to be most certain, okay, not maybe by death, but you will work hard to try to save them. Elo, lo Master Nafshe Vatarach but if you know they're mine, you're just going to ignore it and let it burn. So Rish Lakish says, no, Meshicha is explicitly stated in the Torah that the only way to acquire an item is by pulling it and not by paying money. My Tamad Rish Lakish, what's his reason? Amar Kra, Kitim Karum and Kra Lamitacha. This Pasuk is talking about Ona'a, which we're going to get to later in our chapter, which is overcharging and undercharging. Kitim Karum and Kra Lamitacha, if you sell something to your friend, O Kanomi Yadami Oh, you buy something from your friend. Now, this already you can see there's something weird in this Pasuk. Obviously, if you're selling, you're buying, right? Someone's buying. It seems like you're saying two things that don't need to be said. So why does it say, What's that second part of the pasuk coming for? It's to teach you something is acquired when it's passed from hand to the other. That's when you acquire an item. For Rabbi Yochanan, no, Miyad is coming to teach you. Something that can be passed from hand to hand is movables. And it's to tell you that the topic of that pasuk, doesn't apply to land. Rish Lakish will say, again, we're doing a ping pong. Oh, if you wanted it just to teach you land, I agree with you. There's no one when it comes to land, and that's a topic we're going to discuss another time. So we'll leave it for now. We'll discuss it in a few days. But it would have just said, if you sell something, miyad, from hand, which would mean movables. Amitecha, right? Miyad amitecha, from the hands of your friend. Alto nu, don't have ona'a. But why does it say, kitim kruum am kral amitecha? O kanomi yadamitecha. There's two phrases there. It would have just shoved it all into one phrase. So o kanolamali, it's still unnecessary, that part. So shmami na'ala mishicha. That must be to teach you the laws of mishicha. Which again means you pull the item and not money. Rabbi Yochanan says, O kaname avidle. So what's he going to do with O kano if he doesn't think it's coming to teach Mashiach? Because he thinks by Torah law, money would be kone, giving the money. You need it for a different bright. Now, when you think of, of overcharging or, or mistreating someone when it comes to a business deal, you assume we're talking about the buyer is cheated because that's usually who gets cheated. But, but how do you know that if nit anem mocher, what if I underpay? We saw that before. If I underpay, then the buyer can come back and claim ona also. Talmud Lomar, o kano. That's why it says kitim kiru when you sell and when you buy, that there could be ona in both cases. Barish lakish tarte gamar mine. He just learns both because it says o kano and it says miyadamitecha. So one thing you can learn from o kano, one thing you can learn from miyadamitecha, and that's how he gets the mashiach has kone and also the buyer is going to have a loss of ona'ah. Okay, I see you're asking Adina about how can Rabbi Yochanan say that the rabbis changed the Torah law, but that the rabbis are always instituting zerot. So they're basically going to say, yeah, it, it is a bit of a weird situation, <laughs> which gives a lot more strength to reach the kitchen's position. But yes, when they see a need, and here this would create problems in business, people would really end up losing out like this refukhita kabalia. So because of that, they changed it. So yeah, that's that's his approach. It's a very interesting, unique approach, but we have seen cases. I mean, we had a whole thing about, you know, how could the rabbis institute takanot that go against Torah law with Rabban Gamliel and Gitin, if you remember, 
with the Beetle Ged and all sorts of things. We got to have Ka'at Kiddushin and all that. So it does happen in a bunch of cases. Um, it's also easier when it comes to Dini Mamano because the rabbis have the rights Hefker baked in Hefker. Okay, it's not. Now we're going to bring a, a difficulty. Rish Lakish. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Kosha Kesef Biado, Yado Ala El Yona. Mocheru Dul Matse Hadrabe, Lokech Lo Matse Hadrabe. He says, whoever has the money can renege on, uh, the one who has the money can renege on the deal. The one who paid the money can't renege anymore. So, if you say by Torah law, the money actually does affect a transaction, that's why that's why we can say the lokach can't change his mind anymore. Okay, the mocher still has rights to change mind, but at least we understand by Torah law there's an effective transaction, and that's why we can make this distinction. But but if you say ma'o don't acquire anything by Torah law, then the lokach and why would Rabbi Shimon distinguish between the mocher and the lokach? There's no sale at all. So why wouldn't both sides be able to renege? To which Amar Le Rish Lakish, Aliba de Rabbi Shimon lo kamina. Rish Lakish could say, I just don't hold by Rabbi Shimon. Ki kamina, Aliba de Rabbanam. My whole position is only according to the rabbis. I don't accept Rabbi Shimon's position. I don't, you know, and then it actually, Rabbi Lakish makes a lot of sense because Bishlam Ali Rish Lakish. Hainu di ika ben Rabbi Shimon lo Rabbanan. And then we say, ah, what's the machlok of Rabbi Shimon Rabbanan? Do you think ma'ok konot in a Torah? And then you're going to say, well, but only one side can change their mind. Or do you say, no, e ma'ok konot in a Torah? So that's the whole machloket. But Rabbi Yochanan, my ika ben Rabbi Shimon Rabbanan. According to Rabbi Yochanan, what's the debate? Ika ben ayu de Rav Chisti. You could say, according to Rabbi Yochanan, so we basically took a question that was on Rish Lakish and we flipped it to be a question on Rabbi Yochanan. The main Mashiach was really instituted for sellers. Okay, so now because we instituted it by sellers, that they could be choser. Because the whole thing is we want to make sure that the seller assumes responsibility. So we're going to say we instituted this Mashiach is for Mochorim, for the seller, and Ma'od or not Konot. Well, once we did that, we're going to say it's across the board. And Rabbi Shimon, late, late, Rav Chisti, he doesn't think so. It's just for the mocher, not for the lokech. And then it all fits in with Rabbi Yochanan, according to this explanation. And Rabbi Nan, eat, lu, Rav Chisti, they agree. One last question, Tanan. Remember we said that. Ma'ot, don't do anything. But if you renege, we're going to basically curse you. Okay, so. Yamar bishlama ma'ot kono. That was a quote from the Mishnah. If you say ma'od or kono mishum hachi kai ba'ava, that's why you have this aval misha para and blah, 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 and this curse, because by Torah law, really, it works. And this goes to what you're saying, Adina, about what do you mean? Ma'od actually do. So what do you mean they're not? Well, the fact is, technically, they're not because of this issue. But if you renege on the deal, we're going to basically curse you because ma'od really are effective by Torah law. But yamar ma'od and am kodot, if you say no, am I kai ba'ava? Well, then what's the problem? If ma'od aren't konot mi do raita, so then who cares if you renege? It doesn't make a difference. To which they say, no mishum tibarim. Because you spoke and you should keep the spoke, you know, just because you spoke, you should keep the spoken word. The Gemara is going to ask on that tomorrow. Really? Is there such a thing? You have to, you know, we're going to curse you because you didn't stand up to your word. Okay, we'll get back to that. So quick review of today. We started with Rapuna, who talked about that this pile of money type thing where you don't count the money, the jar of jelly beans, right? You take that, it works like chalipin, and the money is kone, even though normally money is not kone by chalipin, but in this case it is because you're not really using it as money, you're using it more like, like a jar of jelly beans, right? Like an object, okay? Then there was a debate whether he said there was ona or not, right? We thought maybe he said, we said, no, 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 it's working more like a jar, you know, of something. And then we went to who's Whose kalim do you use when you do this chalipin handkerchief transaction? And then we had a debate. It all came from root. From there, we got to another machloket that comes out of root, which was Rav Nachman Rav Sheshet. We may mention of debates that we saw before about whether it has to be a kli or can it be other things as well that you can use for chalipin transaction. Then we define what is an asimon. And then we got to back to this machloket, Rabbi Yochanan Rish Lakish. And then we asked questions, more Abahovach questions at Rish Lakish. One turned into a question on Rabbi Yochanan. You know, but we answered the questions on Rish Lakish and we discussed the two different options and where they get it from and how they derive their opinions from the Psukim. From this will end for today. Wishing everybody a good day. May continue to be uh, safe here in Israel.